Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our 13th annual celebration for women at Wentworth. I'm Christine Kevill, a proud Wentworth trustee and 2016 honorary degree recipient. I'm also president and CEO of Kevill Enterprises, a national construction and management and inspection firm, and I'm delighted to be with you this morning. Each year, the woman at Wentworth brings together alumni, students, faculty, industry, and friends in the various fields of STEM, design, and management in order to make contacts, exchange ideas, and strengthen bonds. The annual Woman of the Year Award honors an individual or individuals whose work reflects the vision and mission of Wentworth while making significant contributions to our industry and community. Through professional volunteer work, the Woman of the Year exhibits leadership, service, commitment, achievement, and outstanding character. I hope you are as happy to be here today as I am because I attend a lot of Wentworth events and this is clearly one of my favorites. This year's program is even more exciting because of the terrific audience and the distinguished panel of leaders that whom we have with us today. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Each panelist is going to receive the Woman of the Year Award for 2019 for reasons that are well known to all of us. Our special guest moderator is also being honored today. Before she tells you more about our panelists and honorees, I would like to personally thank President Kerry Haley, President Gloria Cords Larson, President Zarissa Pontich, and President Jackie Jenkins Scott for honoring us with your presence today. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> and President Pontich, I would like to congratulate you, including everyone here in the room and the Wentworth community for your remarkable 14 years of stellar leadership. And I think that definitely deserves a well-deserved round of applause. Thank you, President Pontich. I also would like to express our gratitude to a few others who have generously contrib contributed to make this such a great event and have supported the Women at Wentworth program. Consigli Construction Company is the founding sponsor of Women at Wentworth. Two years ago, this building industry leader headquartered in Milford, Mass, donated $100,000 to the university to help renovate the campus library and fund a scholarship for Wentworth students in conjunction with the Women at Wentworth program. We are fortunate to have Matthew Consigli here with us today, and thank you for joining us, Matt. Our gold sponsor, Our gold sponsor for today's event is DPS Group Global. Let's give Consigli Construction and DPS Group Global another big round of applause. Thank you very much. And now, Matthew, would you please come forward to say a few words about your company's support for Wentworth and the Women at Wentworth program? Thank you, Matt. All right. Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I must say it is, it is truly an honor to be part of this very special day. You know, when, when Dr. Pontich uh, approached us a few years ago uh, about establishing a scholarship fund uh, to support future women leaders, we, we jumped at the opportunity. Not only did we see it as a chance to support women starting their journey in STEM-related fields, but an amazing opportunity to encourage the journey and to celebrate their leadership. So I'm sure you'll agree that uh, education is the first step uh, towards long-term career success. And at Consigli, we feel it's not only important to support the initiatives that will open the doors for women students, but it's our responsibility. For us, it's a privilege to partner with a major institution like Wentworth, an institution that is creating the next generation of women leaders in STEM industries. Seeing you all here this morning is certainly a testament to the commitment that Wentworth has towards this endeavor, and we're humbled to play a small role to support that mission. So thank you again for allowing Consigli to be part of this very special morning. Thank you for those wonderful words, Matt, and all that you and your company do for Wentworth uh, students. We are fortunate to have one of the recipients of the Woman at Wentworth Scholarship here with us today, 
Fatima Hussein is a senior in computer information systems program. She is now going to share with us a little bit about her uh, experience at Wentworth. Fatima? Good morning, everybody. It is such an honor to be receiving this award. I would like to offer my sincerest gratitude to the Wentworth Endowment Scholarship Committee, as well as the generous scholarship donors for everything, for enabling students like me to be receiving opportunities such as this. I really consider myself to be blessed and lucky. I say that I'm blessed because I am a Somali citizen and was born and raised in Saudi Arabia. And I don't believe a lot of women like me have such opportunities. I owe this to my parents who, have, who are actually not here today, but they're on FaceTime right now, <laughs> um, who have spared no effort to educate my brothers. We're actually in the audience today, rec recording, <laughs> um, who are um, um, for offering um, education opportunities equally for me and my brothers. They have bestowed upon me the importance of a college education. My dad has worked so hard to make sure that my brothers and I get the best education that we can. He put us in private schools to prepare us for college admission in the U.S. And realizing that there weren't many opportunities back home in Somalia, he planned very early on in, two th in the 2000s that we immigrate to the U.S. so that me and my brothers would have more promising opportunities and better opportunities in life. I say that I'm lucky because my dad's visa for the immigration came right at the end of 2014, so when I was still a senior in high school. So I was able to complete my high school um, and move to the US right after with no interruptions. <laughs> I was really well prepared to enroll in colleges in the US, so I didn't have a problem getting admission from a lot of colleges, but I really am so glad that I chose to come to Wentworth. Coming from somewhere where a woman was dependent on her male family member, it was so hard for me to envision my life without being guarded. In my very first year at Wentworth, I was very shy and very afraid to socialize. <laughs> but it is through Wentworth social clubs and getting involved on campus that has really transferred, transformed me to who I am today. Taking the first leap and joining a club such as WILD, which is the Women's Institute for Leadership Development, was my very first step. And I owe it to its mission and initiatives for being able to crack such a tough and bashful shell that I have open. Um, I would also like to thank my professors for providing me with the knowledge and countless hours of support throughout my four years here. I'd especially like to thank Professor Hollis Greenberg, which I believe she's here. <laughs> um, there she is. <laughs> um, for being such a mentor and a fierce female leader in my future career of computer information systems. She has taught me so many project management tools and business software skills that are really necessary for my future. And she's given such countless words of advice and wisdom that I'll forever remember. There are many wonderful professors out there but I think that there are only a few that are as brilliant as her. <laughs> I'm also grateful for the countless and kind Wentworth staff members that I've had a pleasure of getting to know and have made my days here at Wentworth so much more sweeter. Finally, I would like to thank all the wonderful friends I've made throughout my time at Wentworth, both in and out of the classroom. It's, it is through taking that leap and getting involved on campus that I've made lifelong opportunities and 
met so many great friends and made timeless memories to look back on. Thank you to the sweet mates, to the friends, to the coworkers that I've made throughout my time here. I really wouldn't be speaking in front of you today if I hadn't joined things like WILD, things like the orientation team, be a part of the Wentworth Women's Council, be an RA, and work for the library. <laughs> As my time at Wentworth draws to a close this August, I will forever remember the remarkable opportunities I've received at Wentworth, and I do promise myself that when I can, I will give back to the Wentworth community and enrich the life of many students in the same way that Wentworth has helped me. Thank you. Fatima, thank you so much for ex sharing your experience with us and your beautiful words. They truly have touched everyone in the room. Thank you. And we're so excited that you mentioned you're going to stay really, 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 really close to Wentworth. Right, Paula? <laughs> uh, before I turn the program over to our program moderator, uh, Jackie Jenkins Scott, it is my pleasure to tell you a little bit about her very impressive career. Jackie had stayed seated for a while. This is uh, pretty lengthy. You were very, very impressive career. <laughs> Jackie is president and founder of JJS Advising and president of the Massachusetts Women's Forum. From 2004 to 2016, she served as the 13th president of Wheelock College and as the school's first African-American president. She was a passionate advocate in fulfilling Wheelock's unique and compelling mission in improving the lives of children and families. Under Jackie's strategic leadership, the college significantly increased its endowment and com completed an 82 million capital campaign, by far the largest in the college history. Jackie also completed the college's first facilities master plan, resulting in the construction of a contemporary multi-purpose campus center, modern re renovations to student dormitories, and a new state-of-the-art technology-based center for learning and innovation. From 1983 to 2004, Jackie was president and CEO of the Dimmick Community Health Center in Roxbury. Prior to joining Dimmick, she had held several positions in the Massachusetts Department of Public and Mental Health. She has been active in the local education arena for many years. She co-chaired the City School Readiness Action Planning Team for former, former Boston Mayor Thomas Menino and was named co-chair for former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick's Readiness Project. Now let's give Jackie a warm welcome. everyone. Oh my goodness, you can do better than this. It's cloudy outside, but it's beautiful in here. And what a great day to be on this fabulous campus. So I come from the call and response community. And that means when the minister calls out, the audience responds. So I want you to practice. So good morning. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to serve uh, on this as the moderator of this amazing panel. Um, you are in for a treat. These three leaders who are women leaders are absolutely amazing. And I am confident that you're going to leave today both uh, renewed, inspired, and impressed. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panel to you and to um, uh, get us started this morning. Our first panelist is Dr. Carrie Healy. Carrie Healy became the president of Babson College in July 2013 after almost three decades of service in academia, government, and humanitarian work here in the United States and abroad. 
She is the 13th president of Babson College and the first woman to hold that position. Dr. Healy has announced that she will be stepping down as president in June 2019 at the end of her second term. Under her leadership, Babson has strengthened its reputation and position as the recognized global leader in entrepreneurial education. President Healy has presided over many Babson milestones, including welcoming the most diverse and well-qualified students in Babson's history, celebrating the historic successes of Babson's athletics, and taking unprecedented steps to enhance higher education access and affordability. Prior to joining Babson's community, she served with distinction as the 70th Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. She also has led numerous philanthropic initiatives in the United States and abroad, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the World Economic Forum Expert Network. Please welcome Dr. Kara Healy. My dear friend, Gloria Cordes Larson, currently serves as president in residence at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She also serves as a director on the boards of two public companies, Unum Group and Boston Private, as well as a director or trustee on several nonprofit boards. Uh, this says several, it's actually many. <laughs> From 2007 until 2018, Gloria was president of Bentley University, the first woman to serve in that post. During her tenure, Bentley achieved university status, was ranked a top 10 undergraduate business school by Bloomberg Businessweek, and was ranked number one for both career services and internship programs by the Princeton Review. While at Bentley, President Larson also launched the Center for Women in Business with a mission to advance women in the corporate world. The Bentley University Board of Trustees named the center in her honor at the time of her retirement. Larson is author of Prepare You, How Innovative Colleges Drive Student Success, published by Josie Bass, a division of Wiley in 2016. So let's put a plug in for Gloria's book. All of you in higher education, make sure that book is not only on your shelf, but that you read it. Be before joining Bentley, she would had a prestigious career in law, public policy, and business. Please join me in welcoming Gloria Larson. Our last panelist almost needs no introduction because she is your own. Uh, Zaritza uh, Pontic, the president of Wentworth Institute of Technology since 2005, is the first woman engineer to lead an institution of technology in higher education in the United States. Wentworth's first woman president, she is stepping down at the end of May 2019 after a transformative tenure at the university. Under her leadership, Wentworth has introduced seven graduate programs, thus becoming a master's degree granting institution and achieving university status. She is also overseeing the introduction of 10 undergraduate programs, eight in engineering, a $300 million investment in state-of-the-art facilities, and a 20% enrollment increase. Whitworth's enhanced experiential learning model, combined with a focus on innovation and entrepreneurship, results in excellent regional and national rankings, including the top 8% for return on investment in the United States and top 50 women-led businesses in Massachusetts. Please welcome, join me in welcoming 
Dr. Pantic. Now, I'd like to encourage you to think about what you'd like to ask these three amazing leaders. And later on in the program, we're going to have about 15 or 20 minutes uh, for them to respond to your questions. But here, uh, we're going to start with asking each of our panelists a question specific to them and to their career. Uh, we've asked them, now, these women are uh, amazing leaders, as I've said, and they can talk. So <laughs> I have asked them to keep their comments to about two to three minutes. So when I start doing this, <laughs> we'll know that uh, it's time to, to end this um, part of the, the question. So um, I'm going to ask each one of them a question specific to their um, career and their experiences. And we're going to start with um, Dr. Healy. So Dr. Healy, with your background, in government and politics, how did you feel about going into academia as the president of the college? And what lessons um, do you think, or did you think, um, 10 years ago, seven years ago, you would bring to that experience? And how's it turned out? Just a small question. Two minutes? <laughs> So, Jack, Jackie, thank you, first of all, and, and thank you, Sarita, for having us. I haven't been in this hall since your inauguration, when I had the honor of speaking at your inauguration. So this is a wonderful bookend you know, for me to be here again. So congratulations on your tenure. And, and I have to say to you, Jackie, that I recently had the opportunity to um, moderate a panel of six of the prior presidents of Babson College in honor of their centennial. And I was confronted with the same concern you are, which is that we talk too much. And so I asked that a small gong be placed by my seat. So you, and they found me a very delicate gong. And so I would just sort of hover like I was about to gong and people moderated their speech a little bit, not too much. Um, so. So the question, what did I expect? Um, I, I had actually hidden the fact throughout my career that I had a PhD. And so at some point in my career, someone noticed this and thought, hey, she could be a college president. She does have a PhD. Doesn't that make her an academic? And the answer is no. It doesn't make you an academic. And it certainly doesn't make you an academic in the eyes of people who have spent their whole lives uh, being on a faculty, you know, doing research, publishing papers in difficult journals. It's a very different life than simply having gone through that process and getting the PhD. And, and so while I vaguely thought you know, that I understood uh, colleges and universities from having been a fellow at one when I lost some elections or, you know, having been an adjunct from time to time at different institutions. Uh, what I was walking into really confronted me in a very different way. And I think also one of the biggest uh, concerns that I had and other people had when I was making that transition is can someone who has been in partisan pro politics leave that aside and lead the entire institution and not be seen as someone who represents just some part of that institution. And so I have assiduously uh, been nonpartisan, bipartisan the entire time that I've been at Babson. And it's been one of the most important things that, that I've needed to do, especially because of that background in politics. There are also a lot of assumptions that the kinds of uh, talents and, and skills that you develop in politics would somehow be useful as a college president. I think this is entirely false, you know, because you, you assume and as a politician that when you're out there speaking and you're doing something, that there's a large group of people out there, at least 50% of them maybe, that like you and are going to go, yes, she's right. And as a college president, 
no one is standing behind you saying, yes, she's right. So you're, you're, you're looking behind you and there's no one there. And so you have to really begin to be very comfortable in your own skin about, I'm taking these decisions, they're going to be mine, I'm the leader of this institution, and it's going to be something that I'm going to have to explain and moderate. And if I could explain what it is to be a college president, um, the best way I can, can say it, and I, I will end on this, is that I see it as a tug of war between trustees, you are over here, um, uh, faculty, where are you faculty? <laughs> Faculty hands, okay, between you guys. Um, and the president is standing in the middle. And it's the president's job to hold the rope very, very hard and dig their feet in and make sure that there's always a good balance between the interests of the trustees, which are the long-term interests of the college, the fiscal responsibility of the college, its ongoing existence, its reputation, and the faculties, which are extremely critical to also the reputation and the long-term existence of the college, which is the very excellence of the, the curriculum being offered and the relationship with the students. So, um, I, I, I have, I'm tired of holding the rope, um, but, I, but it was a wonderful experience uh, trying to do something so collaborative, which is very different than what you do in politics. Wow, that was a great answer. Thank you so much, but thank you for, your, for taking that balance for the last seven years. You have done a fabulous job at Babson, and they, um, they are lucky to have had you in your leadership. Gloria. You know, I remember Gloria and I are both what they call non-traditional presidents. We didn't come up through the, the academy. And I remember sitting in your law office. Do you remember that conversation we had just shortly before I started as president of Wheelock? And we talked about being a non-traditional president. And Gloria said, you know, I don't think I'd ever be... Uh, a college or university president. And I said, oh, yes, you, yes, you can. You can do that. And sure enough, you were an amazing leader for Bentley. So do you want to talk about that transition from all the amazing things you did uh, and to become a non-traditional president and what that meant for you and the challenges and the, the joys and pleasures that you got out of that? How many of you watched the TV show Survivor? <laughs> Every single week, I would tell my husband and our three Labrador retrievers, I survived another week in the academy. <laughs> and honestly, um, when I look back on 11 years, which uh, just zipped by in a New York minute, um, I have to say after a very long career that crossed every economic sector, I think I was holding out for the last one to be education, the only place I'd not occupied a seat. Um, I've always believed that where your career goes, either in a linear way um, or in you know a more peripatetic way, the way mine did, federal government, state government, um, Secretary of Economic Affairs, many years as a partner at Foley Hoag in Boston. Um, I call myself the accidental tourist, that I ended up with the last chapter of my career as president of a business school. I didn't take, please don't tell Bentley this, I never took a business course in my life. So, So go figure. But what I've always believed is that you should be, it's all about education. That's why you all are also proud and should be of your Wentworth degree. It's about preparation, the things you do along the way in um, the outside world when you leave your education uh, for your next step, and a little bit of serendipity. So I wanted to tell you just a quick story about the serendipity part of this, because my education did not qualify me to be a college president, and I don't have a PhD, but after a semester at Bentley, when my faculty got really tired of me saying, you guys are the smartest people in the world, you actually understand the academy, you are, have a PhD, a delegation came to me and they said, you have a Juris Doctorate. That's a terminal degree. I'd never heard the expression, terminal degree. <laughs> worried me for the longest time. <laughs> what were they suggesting? Um, but here's, here's, the, here's the serendipity. 
I did have a very broad-based generalist background. Um, I had run big government agencies in the federal government and state government. Um, I had done a lot of big projects in Boston, building the convention center. I see a lot of my colleagues who helped make that happen. Um, and I knew the business community really, really well. I'd been the first woman chair of the Boston Chamber. So I think they were looking at Bentley for an outsider who could come in, and I called it taking their light out from under a bushel. But here's where serendipity intervened, because dear Lord, when you sat in my office at Foley Hoag and told me your plans, I thought, boy, you go girl. But I thought never in a million years would anyone want my crazy background for college presidency. So very quickly, I used to recruit for Foley Hoag. And I took a flight down to Charlottesville. I went to UVA to law school. And I interviewed something like 21 young um, second year students who wanted to come to Boston. And it was the bleeding edge of the adult millennials. And at the end of those interviews, I came back to Foley Hoag and I said, I don't care what they want to do with their legal career. This is a different generation. It's the first generation that I'd identified that believed in people, planet, not just profit triple bottom line thinkers. And I got so jazzed by that. And I had just read Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, where he talked about dropping his own college kids off at school and saying, God, the world is going to offer global opportunities to do well in your business by doing a world of good. So I said this story, true story, at a dinner party. Two weeks later, the search committee for Bentley called me and said, you know, how would you like a conversation about this? We're thinking an unorthodox president who can shine the light on what we're trying to pull off here um, is just what we'd like to consider doing. Um, and you might be it. And I remember at the dinner party beforehand when someone had mentioned this, I had poured another glass of wine because it was so improbable. So this is higher ed, nine months of interviews and conversations later. I think 450 people had to sign non-disclosure agreements because I didn't want fully ho. I was sure I wasn't gonna get the job, but here's what happened. My summation is that nine months, I did a really deep dive into Bentley's DNA. And like uh, Dr. Healy, Carrie, <laughs> and, and Dr. Pontich, I came to realize what an incredibly special place it was. And I thought, my God, if we could have kids, and I love our scholarship recipient because she talked about the broader based holistic education. When you can combine a professional background, as all of our schools do, with the liberal arts, with technology state of the art, with real world experience throughout your college, along with that holistic real campus experience, you are giving, you're giving to the world a generation that can really bring change. So I consider after a long career in some public policy, um, some politics, some uh, certainly in the private sector along the way, um, this has been the single most rewarding chapter I could ever imagine, which is why I can't imagine replacing it. Um, and right now I'm hanging out a lot with my husband and our three Labrador retrievers. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you guys for inviting us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pitt. Now, um, for the students in the, off in the audience, the moral of that story is watch what you say at a dinner party. <laughs> it could come back to you. <laughs> Um, Dr. Pontix, you um, immigrated here to the United States. Um, you are an engineer, one of the few, or I think the first engineer to, to lead a university. Um, and given everything that's going on in the world today about issues around immigration, about the role of science and technology, in not only learning, but driving um, the world, driving innovation, driving uh, how we think and how we do and what happens to the brain and the development of the brain and all of that stuff. Um, can you share your thoughts about these two issues and how it's impacted you as a president? Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. I want to thank these two great presidents. I actually feel very unaccomplished because I spent my whole life in academia. So. <laughs> Thank goodness one of us did. <laughs> but I think certainly education has and will always going to play a very important role in the future and the benefit of this country because without educated uh, 
professionals and great thinkers were not going to be able to overcome all the challenges of the 21st century. We are looking at the globalization, we're looking at technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, how we fit as people and as humans within all of that. And I think that's going to be really addressed by our students who are the future of this country, who are learning how to apply technology to make the people's lives better. Our students uh, build sustainable buildings and uh, think about how they can make them better. We have students who are going to produce many medical instruments, again, to save people's lives and also being able to transform the world and all of that bring together for the benefit of everybody. So our students, even though we say that we have the areas of and strong in the areas of engineering, design, management and sciences, our students actually get liberal arts education through uh, many courses that they take in humanities that we have here. So when we say we prepare our students for career success, that means that we are also preparing them to be well-rounded citizens and to have all the benefits of a great education and a great understanding of what is important for the society. I was very impressed by our students. Uh, we uh, had the student awards uh, dinner just two days ago, maybe. <laughs> Everything is going on so quickly. And I was impressed by the achievements and how much our students care about education, care about this institution. And that's actually what attracted me to Vanforth. When I came here and interviewed for the job, I uh, really did not know much about Vanforth. And uh, a colleague of mine told me it's a diamond in the rough, just come and interview. And I came here and I really uh, had a great time talking with students because they were so enthusiastic about their studies and so enthusiastic about what can do for the society. So I said, well, this is the place where I want to be. And you know, I came here 14 years ago, never regretted. And we transformed this institution from the diamond in the rough to be really a premier institution, a university with many recognitions. Now I'm going to brag a little bit about our programs. <laughs> our uh, uh, construction management is ranked number one in the US. Architecture number four, engineering programs are among the 15% in the US. And we provide a great path to career success and upward social mobility. And uh, with the placement rates within six months of graduation, between jobs and graduate schools of 98%, and the starting salaries among the top 10 in the New England region, we really are uh, one of the best schools and uh, ranked for the, our return on investment among the top 8% in the US. So I'm very proud and thank all the... Thank all the faculty and our board who provided the leadership and the staff. And we are just a great community and our students are the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that is... <laughs> I still have a month and a half to go. So yes, I that's <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't want to get anything started up here on this on this panel um, thinking about students now how many students in the audience raise raise your hand if you're a student excellent congratulations how many seniors if you're a senior and you're about to graduate hey 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 congratulations let's give the seniors a round of applause so seniors listen uh, this is the last question and we're going to ask each panelist to answer the same question. And what I'd like you all, Carrie, Zaritza, and Gloria to do is to close your eyes and think back to when you were 21 and you were graduating from college. And I'd like for you 
to think about and share with us, what advice would you give yourself now, reflecting back on, we won't say how many years after 21, but if you think about your 21 year old self, what advice would you give yourself? And then I'd like you to share that with our seniors in the, in the audience. And some of you might be 22 or 23 or 24, but you're you, in that range. Right. Okay. We're going to start with Dr. Healy. Great. Thanks. Um, so, so first of all, I can't remember that long ago. That was a very, very long time. Um, but I think that when I was listening uh, to Fatima speak, I was really excited that she was teeing up my answer for this question because... Um, I think the non-obvious answer is that you need to think about involving yourself in and joining organizations that are probably national or international, but at least community-wide, that can sustain you throughout your life. And it's not a high priority necessarily when you're this age, but in the long run, the things that are going to give you emotional support and strength and career connections uh, are those groups, those, those community groups, those faith-based groups, those friend groups that are really there for you throughout your life. And if you can find ones like religious affiliations or fraternal organizations like Rotary or the Junior League or whatever that have different chapters in different parts of the world that you can plug into wherever you go, it's just going to make your life richer and easier as you move around and create uh, new relationships wherever you go. And young people change their jobs so frequently, you need to have some steady group of people on whom you can rely. And as I've reached my 40s and now 50s, I've seen how these groups really matter to people over time. It's where most of us got our jobs at the dinner party, right? Or, and, and someone obviously knew me personally and gave me a cold call about coming to be president of Babson. I, had, I didn't apply for that job. I didn't know anything about it. And, but someone knew me and thought, she would be good for that, I'm gonna reach out to her. And now research is starting to support that really it's our social networks that allow us to be resilient and allow us to succeed in our careers. Those are the things that really matter. And the best group, and in some ways the most tragic group I've ever been involved in, was a bereavement group for a woman in her 40s whose husband died very suddenly and unexpectedly and a group of about a dozen women and I decided to just meet with her for dinner every two weeks. And we would normally have, we were very busy people, we would never have normally met with anyone every two weeks for dinner. But because we did that, we actually followed each other's lives and careers over the course of five years. We ended up meeting for five years after that event. And during that course of time, Many people went through cancer and the death of their own husbands or um, friends uh, or uh, new careers. Many people got late in life PhDs. You could, it's never too late, you can do this. Um, but it, it, was, it was an extraordinary experience to have that cohort of, of women around me. And I would just urge you to find that group, those groups and, and make them an important part of your life and dedicate yourself to maintaining your, your infrastructure of relationships throughout your life. So important. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. Gloria. <laughs> you can't underscore networking enough, both inside your workplace and externally. That was wonderful advice. And I would add to that, um, don't be shy. Find your voice uh, and find it early. There is great data that Bain did a couple of years ago, and this is going to be specific to the young women in the room, and maybe that's because at 21 I found myself with um, leaving college. I'd gone to, it was the last year that my college, Vassar, was still a single-sex college, all women. And I went into the workplace loaded with confidence, and 
lost my voice when I got to the first workplace, didn't have the confidence to be the one to ask for that next key assignment, um, to ask for a promotion when I thought it was time, to ask for additional education and training so that I could progress in my career. I was suddenly shy about doing that. And Bain did a great study a couple of years ago that said today, young women are graduating college with very powerful voices exuding confidence out of every pore, but they lose their confidence within two years of entering the workplace. And that's because of subliminal bias, of unconscious bias. It's not just in the boardroom, it's because their voices still aren't really heard the same way. So part of it is the lean in, <laughs> the Sheryl Sandberg mantra. It's also about companies changing as we've heard about earlier, thank you, um, their practices in terms of how inclusion, real belonging inclusion um, adds to not simply diversifying your workforce. So a couple of quick stories. I was really lucky early in my career to discover the power of mentoring and sponsorships. I went to work, Federal Trade Commission, I was a young lawyer right out of law school, and I went to work for one of the five commissioners. It happened to be the only woman commissioner. This is back in the dark ages, in the early 1980s. She was one of just a handful of women who was presidentially appointed in all of Washington, D.C. And I went to work for her, and from that moment on, I was barely 30 years old, I thought sky's the limit, there's no glass ceiling. Um, she's done it. She's, she's mentoring me. She then helped me land a great post at the Federal Trade Commission and appointed role myself subsequently. And then I changed my line of work. I moved to Massachusetts. I joined Governor Wells' administration. And I still felt confident because it was still regulatory work, consumer protection work, and, and antitrust work. So I understood that lay of the land. I got called into Governor Weld's office one day and he said, the Secretary of Economic Affairs is leaving his post. I thought you might have some ideas for a successor. And I will never forget that moment because I suddenly went from sitting up straight in my chair facing the governor across his very large desk and I shrunk into my chair and I spent the next 30 minutes giving him the names of five other people even though it was my dream job. I was too scared to offer my own candidacy for that role. He stopped me, he's a pretty impatient guy. I think it was like a little cat and mouse who's kind of dangling me along the way. He said, you know, Larson, I called you in here because I thought you'd be perfect for this. Now I'm pretty sure you're the wrong person for the job. And I learned then that um, others may advocate for you along the way, but no one can be your own best advocate than you. You are it. And it can be hard. Even in 2019, very often, young women early in their careers can't quite find that courage that um, for guys comes maybe a little bit more naturally along the way um, and is more supportive. So, um, so I, I vowed then that I would never again, and at this point I was in my late 30s and should have known better, but he ultimately gave me the chance and it was one of my all-time favorite jobs short of Bentley. But when I got that call, the completely unpredictable call to have a conversation, I found my voice because I remembered that moment where I had lost my confidence and wasn't able to, um, to say, you know, I'm the right person for this job. I surely didn't know if I was the right person for Bentley, but I will tell you by the end of that nine month, 452 interviews process later, I had become so darn competitive that no one including those academic contenders was going to beat me for that post. But it's because I'd fallen in love with the school and the millennials that we've, that we've just talked about and knowing um, that we could play that role. And one of the things that I cared about, of course, my 11 years at Bentley, as we all have, is that all of our graduates, male and female, would find their voice in the workplace and would have those successful careers and great civic lives and, and be really those who were um, good in very broad, for what they were doing in very broad ways. But I made es extra special effort to figure out how can we arm our young women with the kinds of skills that they're going to need when they go forward because the marketplace, as we know, still is not quite at that parity point. So um, it's find your voice and please use it. You will find people so much want to help you along the way. Um, it's We're all in it together. We want our, our workplace and the marketplace to be the best it can possibly be for everyone. Um, and you're, you need to be a participant in that, but others will help you on your journey. Beautiful, excellent advice, excellent advice.
Is it better? What great advice <laughs> from both of you. Uh, what I would first like to say and see our female students think about is taking on a challenge and not being afraid to take on a challenge and new opportunities. Uh, just like Fatima and her family take uh, a challenge and risk and desire to come to this country. That's how I came to this country also. I came on a Fulbright Fellowship though, but uh, it was a challenge that I was ready to face. And uh, when I came here, of course, as a woman engineer, I was a rare bird <laughs> in my lab where I worked on, on the research. I was the only woman and there was no even a ladies restroom on my floor. I had to go <laughs> one floor down. But uh, really because of my upbringing in the country uh, of Serbia, where it was not strange to be a woman engineer, I felt confident and when people would say, oh, you're a woman engineer, with surprise, I was surprised that they were surprised and I would say, I'm just an engineer. <laughs> so uh, that comes, I think, from the environment, just like you said, in which you grow up and which we are surrounded. And this is what we try to provide to our students and through all these uh, activities that we have here in professional uh, societies and support of student services, uh, make sure that you have that confidence to take on the opportunities. And Fatima explained that very nicely, how much she benefited for her, all her engagement uh, here with different support services. So uh, that's the first thing, really believe in yourself, make sure that you understand your worth and you know that you can do it. But of course you have to be well prepared and I know we educate you well to do uh, very well when you go to work. What I would echo also is you need to find a mentor, somebody who will help you along the way. And uh, when you hit the bump, like when you stop at the red light or you reapply your lipstick, well, sometimes. <laughs> so if you hit the bump in your career, I think you have to maybe take a step back and think and learn from it, not lose your confidence, but say what is in there to learn from and how I can move forward and be more successful. And finally, networking, networking, networking. I cannot say how important it is and stress that uh, for every job actually that I was getting came through networking when uh, I was at San Francisco State, I became the director of the School of Engineering because I networked. When I decided to move up, uh, I wanted the Dean's position, I talked to my college, uh, uh, co colleagues, uh, engineering deans in the California State University system. They uh, nominated me at a few places, I got uh, uh, I was on a short list, or I the finalist, the three places got two offers, went to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually very happy in California. I remember uh, crossing the uh, Golden Bay Bridge, going south and looking to the right at the beautiful shimmering ocean on the left hand side, the beautiful city of San Francisco. I told myself, you know, I live in the best country in the world and in this country, in the best state and in this state, in the best city. And next year I went to San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to end this segment. Thank you for that wise advice, all three of you. Beautiful. Uh, where are our timekeepers? How much time do we have? Oh dear. We have about five or six minutes. So we're going to be very quick with our answers and with if you have a question, please come to the mic. Uh, we have our first questionnaire. Hi everyone, I'm Martha. I work at Wentworth and I've been talking to the trustees. And so this is sort of a staged question between us. Can you tell us what kind of programs have you had for your alumni that you found have been really successful in terms of their future engagement and adult learning? Thank you. Um, I'll go Gary, fast. Go, I'll sure. Go. We'll, we'll just, we'll, you like, represent all. Lightning round? Um, I, I found when I got to Babson that we had alumni in 114 different countries around the world. And I knew I couldn't get to them and engage them. 
uh, individually. I could not even visit that many countries. I would be exhausted and never in the office. So I founded a global conference that moved from continent to continent every year, Babson Connect Worldwide, and it brought together the most outstanding entrepreneurs uh, with our alumni from each continent. And we invited people from around the world as well, just for good measure. Uh, and it turned into this giant international alumni reunion uh, in different places. We started in uh, Cartagena and moved it to Dubai and then to Bangkok, back to Spain. And then this year it's back in the US to celebrate our centennial. We have people from 50 different countries coming each year. And our international uh, alumni donations have increased by 500%. Excellent. Yeah. Great suggestion. Yeah. Next question. Hi, my name is Julie. I'm a senior. Um, my question is, how do you deal with criticism in your roles that you're in now versus when you were younger? How do you deal with criticism in your role now? Uh, Gloria. I had to learn early on that it's just water off your back. Um, Carrie said something earlier about looking over your shoulder and expecting there'd be that legion of people supporting you and you look over your shoulder and until the idea has won approval, no one's standing behind you <laughs> applauding. Um, I did the unthinkable at Bitly. Um, we had, um, as you do as well. We've had very successful athletic teams. Um, my women won the national championship, D2 championship, but my D1 hockey team, our only D1 sport, had been playing in a miserable, miserable place. So it was time. Three prior presidents, all guys who probably skated, had passed over it because it was too controversial. And I said, you know what? Girl president, high time we build a $45 million ice arena. Well, all hell broke loose, and I was hard-pressed to find anybody inside the bubble at Bentley who supported it. And what I found, with and, and it can sometimes feel personal, and what I learned along the way is it's just as in the workplace. It's not personal. It may feel that way. It may sound that way at times. Um, but in higher ed especially, it's all about the art of persuasion. And ultimately, when we opened the arena, and it was on time and on budget, and the first platinum lead certified because we have about a bazillion solar panels on the roof. Um, suddenly, my faculty and others were supportive because it, it was paid for. Um, the solar panels had brought us, you know, great reputational gain, and my D1 hockey team was no longer, um, you know, having to go to a really miserable place. But what I found is you just have to understand in any CEO role or any C-suite role, you will be criticized by a lot of different audiences. Um, you listen hard because many times you can take to heart pieces of the criticism and work that into how you do things better next time. Um, but I think one of the most valuable lessons I learned along the way was patience and getting up, spending a lot of time with all of the stakeholder groups so that everyone felt they had even at the end of the day, if a decision gets made and it's contrary to the wishes of some, if you've at least given everyone an audience and have taken it to heart, and usually you can find some ways to build in aspects into your plans. Um, it's a, I was never a litigator as a lawyer, always a negotiator <laughs> and a mediator, um, and in higher ed especially, but I think it's true in any workplace. Um, those are the skills you should call on. It's not the art of the argument, it's the art of persuasion. Excellent. So thank you. Um, as, we, as we prepare to close, and in honor of Women's History Month, I'd just like to ask our panel, uh, with everything going on in the world, um, and you think about, all of you spoke so eloquently about young women, um, and we have, you know, we need allies. We need our men to understand and be supportive. So I'd like to end this session with each of you just giving one word about how you're feeling right now about the opportunities, the hopes, the aspirations, the needs of women and the men who support us. So I'm going to start with our president, uh, Zaritza. And as each one gives their one word, I'm going to ask you to just give them a round of applause for sharing 
um, their stories this morning and for being a part of this important panel. But most importantly, for the work and the contribution that they have each made to their institutions, to greater the greater community we're in in Massachusetts, and to the world. So, um, Zaritza, you your know word. how they say the future is female, but we cannot do it without men. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gloria, we're going to blow right by that one word limit. <laughs> I would say for all of you, but especially for women today, sky's the limit. Go for it. And I would just urge you all to uh, see the deep uh, humanity in one another and to try to pull ourselves together as a nation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to our panel. Great, great conversation. Now it's my honor to turn it back to Christine. All I can say is, wow. Thank you ladies for sharing your experience, your energy, your advice and your values. And thank you Jackie for doing a wonderful job in moderating today. It is now my great pleasure to invite to the stage the following members of the Wentworth Alumni Association Board to help us present the Woman of the Year Award to each of the panelists and our moderator. Candace Nast, Stephanie Holland, Kali Byron, and Carrie Julian, would you please come forward? And thank you ladies for all that you do for Wentworth alumni. Another round of applause for these lovely ladies. As noted at the start of our program, the annual Woman of the Year Award honors an individual or individuals whose work reflects the vision and mission of Wentworth while making significant contributions to her industry and community. Through professional volunteer work, the Woman of the Year exhibits service, leadership, commitment, achievement, and outstanding character. Wentworth is honored this morning to present the Woman of the Year awards to Kerry Haley, Zerissa Pontich, Gloria Corys Lassen, and Jackie Jenkins Scott. Congratulations, ladies. <clears throat> and Candace, can you please come forward to present Kerry with her award? Just pose for the picture, please. Okay. And yes, Stephanie, please come forward to present Glory with her award. Great. Carly, please come forward to present Zeritza with her award. Great. And Carrie, please come forward to present Jackie with her award. One additional big round of applause for all of our awardees. Congratulations, ladies. And a special shout out to our own President Pontich for her exceptional leadership in taking Wentworth to greater heights. Thank you, President Pontich. 
I'd like to also thank our sponsors for today's program, Consigli Construction and DPS Group Global. And before you depart, let me leave you with this final inspiration from the legendary singer, entertainer, entrepreneur, and businesswoman. Does anyone want to guess? Margaret, you are correct. It's Dolly Parton. <laughs> and she said, if your actions create a legacy that inspires others to dream more, learn, learn more, do more, and become more, then you are an excellent leader. So I hope everyone has enjoyed our program that you have, and you make it a great day. Thank you for coming and feel free to mingle. Thank you.